turning out, and uh, thanks in particular to the Free Market Institute and Ben Powell for inviting me to speak. Uh, the title of this talk is Why the North Should have Seceded from the South, The Political Economy of Secession and Slavery. Uh, no doubt all of you are aware that <coughs> the Civil War was the costliest war in U.S. history. Uh, it involved 750,000 killed on both sides, 400,000 wounded. Uh, the number killed is half again as many as were killed uh, uh, during World War II, and six times as many on a per capita basis. Some Civil War battles, such as the Battle of Gettysburg, uh, had more casualties than all previous U.S. wars combined. <coughs> and the Civil War, also had enormous political in, uh, impacts uh, that I consider undesirable. There was a huge, enormous increase in government power and intrusion during the war. Uh, demobilization uh, reduced some of that, but there was a post-war ratchet effect in which the, uh, in the extent of government never went back down to pre-war levels. And in fact, you can date the Civil War as sort of the beginning of um, a secular growth in the power of government. Um, yet, in my opinion, uh, chattel slavery was such an evil and vile institution that the still, Civil War was still worth its cost. Even though emancipation was only an unanticipated consequence, initially the goal of the Union was to preserve, the goal of the, uh, the North was to preserve the Union. Um, <clears throat> but um, it was worth its cost if that was the only way to bring about the abolition of slavery. And the proposition that I wish to argue this evening is that the Civil War's necessity, uh, if the goal was ending slavery, uh, is in question. That letting the Lower South go in peace was still a viable anti-slavery option when Lincoln took the oath of office in front of the unfinished Capitol Dome on that brisk sunny March day in 1861, more than 150 years ago. Now there are two dimensions to this argument. There's a policy dimension and there's a historical dimension. The policy dimension is that I claim that there were a set of policies that the Union could have adopted uh, <clears throat> at the, uh, uh, after secession um, if the Union was interested in abolishing slavery that could have brought down slavery in an independent confederacy, certainly by the turn of the century, and possibly within four years. The historical question is a little bit trickier. Um, if uh, the North had let the South go in peace, would they have adopted those policies? And that's hard to argue, but I'm willing to rise to that challenge. Now, it may surprise you to know that I was clued into this option uh, by the radical abolitionists who burst upon uh, the landscape uh, three decades before the Civil War in the 1830s. Uh, the radical abolitionists were at the extreme end of the anti-slavery movement. And they not only favored uh, immediate emancipation of all slaves without any compensation to slaveholders, but also uh, full political and civil rights for all African Americans. And what is generally not remembered is that they were also advocates of disunion. The most prominent and vitriolic of these abolitionists was William Lloyd Garrison. <clears throat> um, he was catapulted into the limelight on the 1st of January, 1831, with the premier issue of his weekly paper, The Liberator. And in that first issue, he made it clear that he was unwilling to compromise at all on the issue of slavery. This is what he wrote. I will be as harsh as truth and as uncompromising as justice. On this subject, I do not wish to think or speak or write with moderation. No, no, tell a man whose house is on fire to give a moderate alarm. Tell him to moderately rescue his wife from the hands of the ravisher. Tell the mother to gradually extricate her babe from the fire into which it has fallen but urge me not to use moderation in a cause like the present. I am in earnest, I will not equivocate, I will not excuse, I will not retreat a single inch, and I will be heard. 
And of course, Garrison was hurt. Um, <clears throat> Garrison's strategy uh, is interesting. He was opposed to direct political action. He was an anarchist and a pacifist, and his hostility to government was so extreme that he even refused to vote. He once denounced the Constitution for its pro-slavery clauses as, quote, a covenant with death and an agreement with hell. And during one Fourth of July celebration, he publicly burned the copy, um, proclaiming, so perish all compromises with tyranny. He believed that the North should secede from the South. In fact, the slogan, no union with slaveholders, graced uh, the liberators masthead for years. Um, this is showing that I have a copy of the Liberator, uh, original copy from 1860, from which this slide was made. Uh, if you look up in the right-hand corner, uh, it's hard to read in the slide, but uh, he's still running the uh, slogan, no union with slaveholders. And Garrison wasn't the only abolitionist who pursued this strategy. Uh, this is a flag that when John Brown was going around making uh, speeches against slavery, another radical abolitionist that you may have heard of, uh, that has eliminated from the stars and the stripes uh, the slave states that he considered uh, the most uh, undesirable. Even the free black late, the leader Frederick Douglass uh, embraced disunion as a solution to slavery uh, at one time. Now, historians have a hard time confronting this aspect of the radical abolitionists. They tend to um, uh, chalk it up to a naive and kind of uh, naive and ineffectual moral uh, uh, perfectionism on the part of the abolitionists in their, in their effort to sort of uh, symbolically separate themselves from the sin of slavery. I, in contest, con contrast, think that the proposal exhibits considerable um, sophistication, uh, that it was a practical way to bring down the South's, what the Southerners referred to as their peculiar uh, institution, and to appreciate why, however, we need to look at uh, the economics of slavery. Um, one way of thinking about slavery is that a slaveholder um, is like the employer of free labor with some extra options. Uh, like the employer of free labor, the slaveholder can use positive incentives to motivate slaves. And uh, in fact, some slaveholders paid wages, and there was in fact, an implicit wage paid to all slaves in the form of uh, feeding, clothing, housing, uh, no matter how poor it was. Uh, but the advantage that the slaveholder has over the employer of free labor is that he can also use coercion, can also use violence, negative incentives to motivate workers. And what determines which the slaveholder will use is whichever is cheaper at the margin unless the slaveholder is a sadist. Coercion is not costless to the slaveholder. What is the future income stream from a dead slave? To give the extreme example. And so slaveholders face the classic trade-off between positive incentives and negative incentives. And <clears throat> um, which predominated depended on the type of work. And as a result, the Old South's labor market was actually divided into three sectors. There was one sector where um, negative incentives were not impossible, but they were too costly. And employers only used positive incentives. Uh, you only saw free labor doing jobs uh, that uh, uh, required the use of firearms, wide dispersion, extensive travel, uh, handling large sums of cash, et cetera, et cetera. Notice, by the way, these tended to be the higher paying jobs. 
And then there was a sector of the labor market where the trade-off was so close that you saw slaves and free uh, labor going head-to-head -head in competition. This included skilled uh, crafts, artisans, blacksmiths, masons, carpenters, and also in southern factories. Southern factories could be uh, profitably managed both as slave labor or free labor. And then you saw a sector where negative incentives were cheaper and you only saw slave labor, and that was on the plantation, large plantations, the agricultural uh, sector. In fact, if you look at the history of plantations, uh, <clears throat> it turns out that uh, plantations usually almost universally disappear when emancipation takes place in the West Indies um, and elsewhere. Now, to give you an idea of how different factors can affect this trade-off, how many of you have seen uh, either version of the horrible movie Ben-Hur. <laughs> um, Ben-Hur is a, a, a character in ancient Rome, and part of the movie, he is employed, well, he is forced to work as a galley slave. It turns out that this is very historically inaccurate. Galley slavery was virtually unknown in the ancient world. And the reason was that oarsmen also had to be able to fight. You only see the emergence of galley slavery in the Mediterranean with the invention of gunpowder. And then the oarsmen no longer had to fight. Okay, so we're looking, so far I've looked at slavery from the perspective of the slaveholder. Now let's turn this around and look at it from the perspective of the slave. Uh, for the slaveholder, positive and negative incentives are just two alternative costs. But every dollar paid as wages is a dollar uh, received by the workers. Whereas every dollar allocated to the coercion of slaves, such as hiring overseers, uh, is not a benefit to the slave. It's a cost to the slave. In economic jargon, it's dead weight loss. Right? It is resources um, essentially thrown away. And all you can say, uh, all of slavery is enforcement costs therefore represented dead weight loss. And all you can say about the enforcement costs um, uh, uh, and were a social burden for the entire system is that as long as the enforcement costs were borne by individual uh, planters, the burden fell entirely on the slaves. Um, <clears throat> but this ceases to be true uh, however, if slaveholders can socialize enforcement costs and impose those costs on others, and what institution is generally used to impose costs on others? The government. At the time of the Civil War, only one quarter of Southern families owned slaves, but they were the wealthiest one quarter. So it will not surprise you to learn that slaveholders were very successful at getting subsidies from government at all levels in enforcing slavery. The chief mechanism at the state and local level was a system of slave patrols. Established in nearly every slave state, they enforced black codes, apprehended runaways, monitored rigid pass requirements, broke up large gatherings, visited slave quarters randomly, inflicted impromptu punishments, and when uh, occasion arose, suppressed insurrection. And how were they financed? Well, in the border states, they were financed with taxes, uh, but in most of the South, uh, serving on the, the slave patrol was compulsory. Patrol duty, duty was compulsory for most able-bodied white males. This is an era and region where professional police uh, were virtually unknown. Um, again, you can't read it very clearly, but the, the way the system worked was similar to the militia, uh, you would be called up to duty. Uh, you could get out of duty either by hiring a substitute or by paying a fine. So this lists some of the fines. And for instance, in Texas, uh, the fines uh, for uh, failing to uh, provide patrol duty were between $5 and $10, which doesn't sound like very much, but to get 
turn that into modern dollars, you need to multiply it by 25, and then you have to recognize that, um, <clears throat> that the uh, income per capita was much lower in this period than it is today. Uh, so the wealthy could escape uh, the slave patrols, but uh, not poor whites. So notice the irony, right? A kind of uh, coerced labor from white, uh, poor whites is being used to enforce um, uh, uh, coercion against uh, slavery. And this has very perverse results because it reduces the cost of coercion to the slaveholder to the individual planter. And that shifts the mix, uh, the optimal mix for the planter towards more negative incentives and fewer positive incentives. The slaves are worse off, dead weight loss goes up, but now the dead weight loss is uh, falling on the free white population. At the national level, uh, the way that the main way that the U.S. government subsidized slavery was with the Constitution's fugitive slave clause. No person held to service or labor in one state under the laws thereof, escaping into another, shall be discharged from such service or labor, but shall be delivered up on the claim of the party to whom such service or labor may be due. Um, this is the reason the Underground Railroad terminated in Canada rather than Pennsylvania. Uh, and Congress was not shy about enforcing the Fugitive Slave Clause. Uh, the first Fugitive Slave Act was passed during the Washington administration. The second act, passed in 1850, is one of the most draconian laws that Congress has ever enacted. It empowered a special class of bureaucrats, known as commissioners, to hear the case of the fugitive. And the a commissioner would uh, receive a fee of $10 if he decided uh, that uh, the fugitive was indeed a slave, and only a fee of $5 if he decided that the uh, fugitive wasn't actually a slave, but was uh, 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 being kidnapped into slavery. Uh, moreover, the commissioners could conscript the aid of private citizens, and if you in any way interfered, uh, with this operation, uh, or refuse to assist it, you could face a $1,000 fine, six months in prison, $1,000 civil damage for um, each escaped slave. And the alleged fugitive had no procedural rights whatsoever. No, <clears throat> no jury, no attorney, no right to testify. And in fact, this is the law that inspired Garrison's uh, denunciation of the Constitution. And his disunion strategy was to turn the North into a haven for runaway slaves, increase slavery's enforcement costs, and eventually bring the system down. So how realistic was this um, <clears throat> strategy? Well, if you study slavery, you will notice that runaways have always been the Achilles heel of the slave system. This is why in the ancient world, um, slave trading was a major component of early commerce because slaves were more valuable if you moved them to areas they were unfamiliar with and they couldn't run away. In the early history, colonial history of Massachusetts and South Carolina, they captured many Indian slaves what did they do? They sold them to the West Indies. In fact, in South Carolina, they sold them to the West Indies and used the money to purchase black slaves, <laughs> which only makes sense when you think about the runaway problem. If you look at slavery in South Africa, um, slavery in South Africa did not depend on uh, enslaving the indigenous, indigenous Khoisan uh, peoples. Um, it depended on importing slaves from other areas of Africa. The acquisition of Florida, uh, by the U.S. was in large part uh, motivated by the worry that even though um, Spain had uh, technically eliminated slavery in its territory, it was very hard to capture fugitives after they had caught, crossed an international border. The um, U.S. government's most expensive and protracted Indian War, the Seminole War, involved the fact that the Seminoles harbored many fugitive slaves. 
and Texas. Most of you know that Texas was independent for a while um, and have been spurred uh, in its efforts to be annexed by the U.S. So Texas began looking at England uh, and uh, considering becoming a client of, in of England. Well, the deal was that the English were only going to consider that if Texas abolished slavery. And that's when John C. Calhoun and John Tyler and other slaveholders began moving heaven and earth to bring Texas into the Union because they did not want um, a free Texas uh, along the southwest border. Uh, the Supreme Court actually made a decision uh, about the Fugitive Slave Clause in 1842. It's called Prig versus Pennsylvania. Um, it had pro-slavery elements and anti-slavery elements. The anti-slavery element was that um, it ruled that states had no positive obligation to help in the enforcement uh, of the fugitive slave uh, uh, law. But uh, the anti-slavery part was that slaveholders were perfectly free to go into the North and without uh, any authorization whatsoever, <laughs> seize slaves on their own using uh, personal force. Um, as a result of this, uh, many northern states, actually had started before uh, this decision, but many more northern states began uh, passing what were known as personal liberty laws, uh, which uh, um, restricted the uh, realm of the state and local government in apprehending or assisting in the apprehension of uh, fugitives. Uh, <clears throat> one of the um, the southern reaction to this law, these laws, was uh, quite uh, vehement. Uh, one Virginian who served both in the state legislature and Congress, Charles James Faulkner, said of uh, Pennsylvania's new personal liberty law, quote, it has reduced our slave property, property utterly insecure, pardon me, it has rendered our slave property utterly insecure. Slaves are absconding from Maryland and this portion of Virginia in gangs of tens and twenties, and the moment they reach the Pennsylvania line, all hopes of their recapture are abandoned. The existence of such a law on the statute book of any state is not only a flagrant violation of the spirit of the federal constitution, and indeed of its express provisions, but a deliberate insult to the whole southern people, which would amongst nations wholly independent and disconnected by federal relations be a just cause of war. Now, he actually uh, is exaggerating um, the number of uh, slaves who escaped. Uh, the census uh, data suggests that the number was as low as 1,000 per year. Um, although there's other data in terms of the growth of the, uh, of the African uh, community, African-American community in Canada, uh, that suggests the number was um, higher. But the critical point is not every slave has to run away um, in order for this to affect the value of slaves. Right? How, how much are you going to be willing to pay for shares of Microsoft stock if a critical number of them can run away? So here is uh, showing how the probability of a slave running away affects the value of the slave. A prime field hand cost $1,200 uh, at the time of the Civil War in South Carolina. Uh, the probabilities there on the side are percentages. You can see that if the probability is 0.01%, the fall in value is very low. But you get up to 1%, and you've um, lost a considerable amount. The price falls to 1800 the present value of the future income extracted is 10% the price of the slave has fallen in half, which is why you have slave, you have, um, slave prices higher in the southern states than uh, southern slave states than in the border slave states. You have this price gradient in which slaves are now only moving from the east coast into the southwest, but they're moving from the upper south uh, downward. Now, 
his, the historians have tended to uh, dismiss the fugitive slave uh, question because it looks at the proportion of runaways out of the total slave population. This is the information from the seventh census. You have 1,000 slaves running away uh, during the year um, uh, with a population of 3.2 million slaves. Uh, notice that uh, the, prob the uh, proportion of the total population is 0.03%. But that's the wrong way to look at the number because not every slave is um, equally likely to run away. Infants do not run away. Pregnant mothers do not run away. It's prime field hands and skilled slaves, the most valuable slaves that run away. And you also have to look at location. Right? Slaves from Alabama had very little chance of uh, running away permanently to the north. But slaves in Virginia, um, in Kentucky, in Missouri, had a much greater opportunity. And as a result, you see um, that from the period to um, 1830 uh, to 1860, uh, while the proportion of slaves um, in all the slave states has remained fairly constant at one third, you look at the border states, Delaware, Maryland, Kentucky, and Missouri, uh, and I could affirm in West Virginia if I had the data, um, the proportion is steadily um, declining. Notice um, in Delaware, uh, the proportion of slaves out of the total population is less than 1%. In fact, by this time in Delaware, 90% of African Americans were already free. Uh, in Maryland, it's fallen from 23% to 12%. In Kentucky, it's fallen from 24% to 19%. In Missouri, from 17% to less than 10%. Uh, the number 10 20% is pretty critical because that's the proportion of slaves out of the total population in New York after the American Revolution when New York uh, adopted gradual emancipation. Uh, <clears throat> In other words, Garrison was hoping for a domino effect. If you eliminate the federal subsidy to slavery, that first brings down slavery. Uh, in the border states, those states become free states, uh, and then uh, the process uh, eventually reaches the Deep South. And again, Southerners were quite aware of this. Again, quoting James Faulkner, uh, no proposition can be plainer than that the slaveholding interest in this country is everywhere one and the same. Remember, he's from Virginia. An attack upon it here is an attack upon it in South Carolina and Alabama. Whatever weakens and impairs it here, weakens and impairs it there. The fanaticism of Europe and Northern America is embarked on a crusade against it. We must stand or fall together. Why were Southerners so intent on making Kansas a slave state when everyone knew it was not very suitable for plantation agriculture? In fact, Southerners were far more united uh, about making Kansas a slave state than they were behind the very fil very, various filibustering expeditions that tried to um, incorporate slave uh, uh, regions of Central America or the Caribbean. And historians have half the story right. You bring in Kansas as a slave state, and you have two more senators uh, from slave states. But the other half of the story was actually revealed by Senator David Atchison of Missouri, who was one of the border ruffians who was involved in trying to make Kansas a slave state. And he said essentially, look at the map. Missouri is already bordered on two sides by free states. If Kansas comes, on, comes in as a free state, we will not be able to hang on to our slaves. If you look at the South Carolina Ordinance of Secession, the grievance they give the most play to is not Abraham Lincoln's election. It is the failure of Northerners to comply with the fugitive slave uh, provision. 
Um, now, partially, this was a rhetorical play because it allowed them to argue that Northerners had uh, abrogated the constitutional contract uh, before Southerners, but it reflected a genuine concern uh, about uh, the impact of fugitive slaves on the future of slavery. Now, if you've followed my analysis so far, then the question should have popped into your mind, since secession might uh, <coughs> accelerate the decline of slavery, why did Southern slaveholders risk it? And the answer is, look at the alternative. It's become a commonplace that government today is dominated by special interests. That's always been true. It's just less objectionable when government is smaller and less obtrusive. And one of the major special interests that dominated the US government from soon after adoption to the Constitution, right up until 1860, is what Republicans and abolitionists call the slave power. Despite being a minority in the South, slaveholders not only dominated local and, uh, and, and state governments, they also dominated the national government. Southern slaveholders held the presidency more than two-thirds of the time over that period, 49 uh, uh, out of uh, 72 years. 24 out of 36 speakers of the House have been slaveholders. 25 out of 36 um, presidents pro tem of the, Sen of the Senate have been slaveholders. 20 out of 35 Supreme Court justices have been slaveholders, giving slaveholders a majority on the court at all times, and then in 1860, a man had been elected president, Abraham Lincoln, who not only did not carry a single slave state, but within 10 of them didn't even get a single recorded vote. The South had become irrelevant in determining the uh, president's uh, election. All of a sudden, this special interest that had uh, dominated the Union since the beginning was politically dispossessed. Secession was a risky gamble. Many slaveholders felt they had nothing to lose. One Georgian uh, wrote his congressman, Alexander Stevens, uh, arguing that uh, independence would permit Southerners um, to erect, quote, an impassable wall between the North and the South so that Negroes could not pass over to the North or an abolitionist come South to annoy us anymore, close quotes. In other words, a reverse border patrol or a Confederate Berlin Wall. But other Southerners disagreed, including Stevens himself, who became Confederate vice president. He actually opposed Georgia's secession, um, saying that slavery is much more secure in the Union than out of it. Only in South Carolina did secession pass by overwhelming majorities. Um, in every other state that seceded in the initial wave of secession, uh, there were considerable numbers who were opposed to secession. And remember that only the Lower South has seceded at the time of Lincoln's inauguration. At the time of Lincoln's inauguration, there are still more slave states in the Union than out of the Union. It's only with the call for troops after the firing on Fort Sumter that uh, Virginia, um, North Carolina, uh, Tennessee, and Arkansas uh, joined the Confederacy quickly doubling the size of the material resources of the Confederacy. Ultimately, the runaway played a crucial role in slavery's class. Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation of January 1863 technically freed very few slaves because it only applied to the areas of the Confederacy that the Union had not yet occupied. So it didn't apply to Tennessee, it didn't apply to large parts of uh, Louisiana, it didn't apply uh, to counties um, in Virginia, yet it struck at slavery as effectively as any measure that encouraged fugitives. Slaves began flocking to Union lines. The estimate is that between 15 and 20 percent of slaves uh, ran away, but as a result of that, labor discipline collapsed throughout the South, and by the end of the Civil War, the Confederacy itself had moved to emancipation. Um, slavery collapsed in Maryland. Maryland is one of the slave states that didn't secede. But when Congress introduced, uh, um, um, instituted compensated emancipation in the District of Columbia, uh, 
uh, slaves from Maryland <laughs> began moving into Washington City, and that uh, sealed the end of slavery um, in Maryland. Let me conclude with one final example of the power of Garrison's strategy. Slavery had existed since the dawn of civilization on every continent. And although no one liked being a slave, very few had questioned its legitimacy or necessity. Until 1775, when Philadelphia Quakers organized the world's first anti-slavery society. That was the beginning of a worldwide abolitionist movement that turned the 19th century into the century of emancipations. Over six million <coughs> slaves achieved some kind of freedom in that century throughout the Western Hemisphere. No abolition was completely peaceful, but only in the US and Haiti, uh, out of 20 or so uh, slave countries, was there massive violence. After the US abolished slavery, there were only two major slave economies left in the New World, Cuba and Brazil. Brazil had a plantation economy very similar to that of the US. But it also had a very strong abolitionist uh, movement, partly because manumission of slaves was much more common um, in Brazil, and so there was a much larger population, proportionally, of free blacks. And as a result, in Brazil, in 1871, adopted a gradual emancipation law. But the gradual emancipation law freed no living slaves. It only freed slaves who were born after passage of the law when they reached the age of 21. However, in 1884, the northeastern province of Ceará abolished slavery and became a haven for runaways. Brazil had a fugitive slave law, but it was unenforceable, and you saw the same domino effect that um, Garrison had hoped for. By 1888, planters went along with immediate and uncompensated emancipation, because they were worried if they held out any longer, they would lose title to their lands. How many years is it from 1884 to 1888? Four years? How long was the Civil War? Four years? The abolitionist movement was usually a minority everywhere. Yet, in little more than 100 years, it was able to take a labor system that had been ubiquitous and practically wipe it off the face of the earth. Now, I know that chattel slavery still persists illicitly and clandestinely. But we now live in a world in which no dictator, no matter how tyrannical or bloodthirsty, would dare get up and publicly defend owning another human being. And not only is that a stunning testament to the power of ideas, but it represents classical liberalism's uh, most impressive and enduring triumph. Thank you for your attention.